Hello everyone. It's indeed a pleasure and privilege to be here with you all for this uh, virtual ventilation workshop being or organized under the auspices of NNF Telangana State and NNF Maharashtra State Branch. And my sincere thanks and gratitude to the presidents, uh, Dr. Srinivas Murki and Dr. Sandeep Kadam and their organizing team for giving me this opportunity to be uh, participating in this event. So uh, let's get on with our topic and let me share the screen. And uh, yeah, well, in the part one of uh, this presentation, we shall learn about neonatal X-ray chest. When shown an X-ray, let us realize that it's not the eyes which would help interpret the X-ray. What it matters is that eyes see provided the mind knows. And mind is like a parachute. It works best when kept open. And therefore, as we embark on this journey of interpretation of neonatal X-ray chest, let's keep our eyes open, but more importantly, our minds also open. In the first part of this presentation, I shall deal with technical know-how of chest X-ray. And at the end of the session, you would be able to have a structured and organized approach to interpretation of chest X-ray. In part two, we shall deal with diagnostic patterns of common medical and surgical disorders that you would come across in your clinical practice. And you would be able to identify the variations and complications arising thereof. So let's get started with part one of interpretation of chest X-ray. Well, uh, if I were to ask you, in which of the following conditions would you ask for an X-ray chest? A, routinely for a baby on ventilator, B, routinely pre and post extubation, C, to document lung clearance, D, following change of every uh, endotracheal tube, and E, for every desaturation episode that takes place. So let me pause here and give you five seconds to answer what would be your indications for doing an X-ray in your unit. Well, if you have answered one or more of these as uh, an indication, obviously it is time that you change your practices. For the first thing that you should remember is none of these serve as an indication for ordering an X-ray chest. Let me explain. It is futile to daily present an X-ray for the baby on the ventilator simply because clinical information is far more superior to what otherwise would be provided by unnecessary daily exposure uh, by asking for an X-ray. Routinely pre and post extubation, but would not ask unless clinically indicated Obviously, clinical impression of lung clearance will be far more superior than the one on the X-ray. And we do know that the X-ray changes take time. Following every ET change, it would not be a good practice simply because we have learned that an ET card will help us identify and define the correct endotracheal tube position. And following every desaturation, we have what is called as a dope approach which will help us identify bedside rather than wait for an X-ray, which would be indicated only in certain situations. So the first message is you would henceforward not ask for an X-ray in any one or more of these situations. So what would be your indications for doing an X-ray? Well, you would order an X-ray for diagnosis and planning treatment for medical or surgical disorder affecting the lung, heart, or 
the gut. You would ask for in case of acute deterioration following your clinical assessment uh, to identify the underlying cause. And last but not the least, you would need it to define the position of lines, tubes, and catheters, of which we shall learn soon. So having identified uh, when to do an X-ray, let's get started on shooting an X-ray. First and foremost is as the X-ray portable comes into your unit, all those concerned for uh, involved with the X-ray uh, procedure must wash hands. Hand hygiene takes a priority. The duty of the staff would be to supervise the position of the baby to ensure warmth, allowing uh, normothermia and preventing hypothermia from setting in. The staff would also be involved for quieting the baby if it gets agitated. The role of the extra technician would be to check the field of view, remove lines, tubes, catheters, or uh, any other equipment which is coming uh, in the view of your X-ray. And more importantly, ensure that the baby is not placed on the cassette directly, but the cassette is covered with a clean cloth and is placed beneath the baby. Mind you, if you place the baby directly on the cassette, the baby will get cold and it's not a good practice. But more importantly, is protection, protection of the self and that of the others. By that, we mean that the person who is shooting the X-ray will stay six feet uh, uh, away from the beam and should be wearing a uh, lead apron. And obviously, if somebody is pregnant, they should not be allowed to operate in the nearby vicinity. Now look at this X-ray. What we find is, uh, an infantogram, in fact, you would see the X-ray chest and the X-ray abdomen clearly visible. And obviously this is not the way uh, we should be asking for a, in a baby who is on the ventilator. For we should restrict ourselves to the focused point of view of interest and that is lungs only. And therefore a babygram or an infantogram unnecessarily exposes the baby to expo uh, radiation. And that's what, what we don't want. Secondly, what you also see is hands getting uh, across the field of vision. Again, uh, that's not a good way by which we would shoot an X-ray. More importantly, attention must be given to the position of the head, for we want the baby to be in neutral position with the head in sniffing position. Flexion will push the endotracheal tube down. Extension will pull the endotracheal tube and if you rotate the baby's head to one side, again, it will cause the endotracheal tube to move up. So the bottom line is we need to ensure the baby's head remains in neutral position. There is a tendency to lift both the hands of the baby up. While doing so, what happens is you're indirectly also probably lifting the chest and would give rise to lordosis on the X-ray. And therefore, uh, a uh, better way would be to keep the hands in the sideways position or just down and supporting the head while the X-ray is being taken. Having learned that, uh, we also must ensure that following every X-ray for the chest or for that matter abdomen that you take for term or preterm babies, you must document the exposure that is used simply because when a new person enters the unit, we don't want series of trial and errors of X-rays for exposures to take place. And if you have documented the exposure, you know henceforward for all such babies, you would use these settings, which will give you an instant and a good quality X-ray. Well, which X-ray view would you order? In newborns, we use what is called as the AP view or the entero-posterior view. What it means is the beams of X-ray pass from anterior to posterior side and the cassette is placed posteriorly. So the baby lies on the cassette. When we ask for a PA view, the X-ray beams pass from posterior to the anterior side and the cassette is placed anteriorly. What it means is that for 
uh, babies who are in the NICU or for that matter, all non-ambulatory patients, whether in pediatric or adult intensive care units, one would order for an AP view. At times, one would order a lateral X-ray chest, especially if you are suspecting a small air leak, a small free fluid, you want to assess uh, the position of a particular uh, field of interest uh, in the mediastinum, or if you suspect a space occupying lesion. But for all practical purposes, the neonatal X-ray remains an AP view. Well, what should be the beam position? At this stage, look at these two X-rays, compare them. Which of these two do you think is most appropriate? And in your unit, which of these two X-rays are most commonly uh, uh, available? Obviously, you find that the right X-ray is far superior compared to the left. What it means is the left X-ray is an error which has taken place in terms of shooting because of error in the beam position. And this is a lordotic X-ray. This is not a lordotic X-ray, and this is what we should aim for. So how do we know that we are not going to shoot a lordotic X-ray? There are two practical tips that I wish to share with you. The first is the position of the beam should be uh, 10 degrees tilted posteriorly, rather than being held perpendicular to the baby. If you have it perpendicular to the baby, you will end up with a lordotic view. However, the other way, if you are keeping this uh, vertical, the other way of uh, getting an appropriate X-ray is tilt the head end of the baby by uh, 10 degrees up. So what it means is either the X-ray tube or the baby has to be shifted by 10 degrees. When it is an X-ray beam, it is a uh, posterior tilt of 10 degrees, or if it is a baby, it is an upward tilt of 10 degrees, which will help prevent a lot of view from taking place. What is also equally clear is we should aim the X-ray beam in the point of interest or the field of interest at the mid sternum level so that uh, you get an adequate uh, area which is being covered by the X-ray. Having said that, what is the structured approach for evaluating an X-ray chest of the newborn? And what I prefer here and I share with you is the doctor ABCDEF approach. So let's look at each of these components quickly. The D here stands for details and data of the patient and the date, of the, date on which the X-ray is shot. What it means is you should be uh, interpreting the X-ray, knowing the clinical details, the clinical course, the lab details, and more importantly, as if it is multiple X-rays which have been done, whether uh, the series and trend of X-rays that need to be looked at, the X-ray obviously should be confirmed that it belongs rightly to that patient only, for there may be similar patient with the similar name, and you would end up uh, interpreting it wrongly for that patient. Time and again, literature has recorded uh, wrong patients uh, being uh, treated based on the X-ray and more importantly, wrong side procedures being performed based on the X-ray simply because we forgot these basics. So uh, without having a clear idea of these, do not uh, venture forwards for interpreting the X-ray. More importantly, document which is the right side and this is done by the technician uh, as the x-ray is shot and we will soon learn more about what is the importance of documenting the correct side. So D stands for details and data of the patient along with the date. What does uh, R of the Dr. ABCDE stands for? R stands for reading the x-ray quality and when we say reading the x-ray quality we are looking at three components. These are uh, easily identified by RIP, which stands not for rest in peace, but for rotation, inspiration, and penetration. Now let's look at each of these components uh, separately. The quality of the film is first assessed by looking at the rotation. By that we mean in this X-ray, what you find that both the clavicles are parallel to each other and they make a T with the 
vertebrae. So when you find this T with equidistance from the vertebral column of both the clavicles, we know it is a well-centered film. And a well-centered film will have ribs which run parallel to each other and will have both the hemithoraxes symmetrical. So based on this, we have identified what is meant by a well-centered film. Now, uh, look at uh, this X-ray and what you find here is a crooked film. Why do you say this is a crooked film? Now look that the spine and the two clavicles are not equidistant and therefore there is a rotation which is happening to the left. What happens is if it is a rotated film, there is prominence of the hilum on that side. The vascular markings appear prominent and it also give ri gives rise to a prominence of the heart giving an impression of cardiomegaly. So never make an attempt to interpret a rotated film. Now look at this X-ray. What you find here is that there is again a rotation which has taken place and this has led to a false appearance of uh, opacification affecting the upper and the mid lobe, mimicking a parenchymal lesion. So the bottom line remains is that if it is a rotated film, parenchymal lesions appear uh, unnecessarily or falsely recognized and there is change in the vascular markings and the shape of the heart giving rise to a false pathological condition. And therefore, rotation always should be judged looking at the T that we just talked about. So the first uh, principle for, attend, uh, 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 for looking at quality of an X-ray is about rotation. Now look at the second principle and that is of inspiration. By that I mean, you must be able to identify whether it's an inspiratory film or expiratory film. Now this is possible by counting the ribs. Now remember that the posterior ribs are straight and are near the spine. So what are most prominent on the X-ray are the posterior ribs. In contrast, the anterior ribs are curved and are seen lateral to the X-ray. Normally, you should be able to see six ribs anteriorly and eight ribs posteriorly to identify that this is a good inspirator film. Now, let's look at this X-ray. Obviously, what are prominent are the ribs which are seen, which we said are parallel, appearing nearer the spine, and therefore these are the posterior ribs versus the anterior ribs, which are moving from side. So they are lateral and they have a curving direction, which tells you that they are anterior ribs. So normally you should be able to count six anterior ribs and eight posterior ribs to say that this is a good inspiratory film. Now look at this X-ray. Here you find that this is an expiratory film. This is the same X-ray of the baby half an hour down the line. And now you find that following a change in the respiratory pattern, what has happened is what appeared to be cardiomegaly here in the expiratory film has suddenly disappeared. This would have unnecessarily led to investigations and on a wrong track when it came to interpretation, if you were not aware that henceforward, you will not comment on an expiratory film for the size of the heart and the pediastinum. So that's the second uh, quality uh, that you keep in mind while interpreting the X-ray. The third quality that you keep in mind is that of penetration. By that we mean, uh, normally that the vertebral column with the intervertebral disc should be just visible behind the cardiac shadow to say that this is an X-ray of adequate exposure. Now look at this X-ray. What you find here is the vertebral column hardly visible. The entire lung fields appear whitened out and the skin folds and the soft tissue have become prominent. So what happens here is that this is a over uh, this is a under uh, exposed film now look at this film this is an over exposed film simply because the vertebral column now appears very prominent the cardiac shadow has gone into the background 
both the lung fields appear black and the skin soft tissues are hardly visible so this is a over penetrated film which leads to obliteration of the lung markings and the skin and the soft tissues seem to disappear and therefore your exposure is looked at by observing for the intervertebral space behind the cardiac shadow to say that this is an adequately exposed film and overexposed or underexposed film will lead to errors so uh, we talked about three things so far when it came to uh, interpreting the quality of x ray that is rip and we said rip stands for rotation i stands for inspiration p stands for penetration so let's move to the further part of our syndromic approach for reading an x ray going beyond the doctor so d stand stood for the date and the data of the patient and r stand stood for reading the quality of x ray by looking at the rotation inspiration and penetration so let's look at a that is the airway of an x ray so the structured approach involves first looking at the x ray uh, for the airway we know that the trachea is centrally situated it bifurcates into the right main bronchus and the left main bronchus the right uh, bronchus appears to be more or line in uh, with the main uh, trachea and the bifurcation is identified by means of carina now look at this x ray the airway appears to be shifted to the right whenever you find that the airway is shifted it may be pulled or it may be pushed if the airway appears to be shifted because of a underlying pathology collapse of the underlying lung or fibrosis of the underlying lung the airway will be pulled to the same side now look at this uh, x ray there is again the airway which is which appears to be on the left side and you find the feeding tube also has deviated in terms of its course telling us that there is something which is pushing the tube on the opposite side so when you find that the airway is pushed to the opposite side it is secondary to underlying uh, accumulation of air as with pneumothorax a space occupying lesion or free fluid in the lungs that is by means of pleural effusion so that is how you look at the airway which should normally be in the center and show clear uh, demarcation of the right and the main uh, bronchus following the airway we now move down into the hilum and the hilum structures are pulmonary vessels lymphatics or lymph nodes if the pathology affects one or more of these obviously you are going to get an abnormality now look at this x ray it shows prominent vascular markings at the hilum telling that this is a plethoric lung so there is increased pulmonary blood flow now look at this x ray it shows that the hilum hardly has any vascular markings telling us that this is an oligemic lung fields secondary to decreased pulmonary blood flow so the structures in the hilum are reflected on when we try to interpret the hilum following hilum we look at the mediastinum now there is one space occupying lesion which is universally seen in the first two years of life more so in the newborns and look at these set of x rays what you find here is a structure in the mediastinum giving a bat wings appearance a widening of the mediastinum a uh, mimicking a uh, upper lobe consolidation and giving rise to a sail sign and this great mimic which you find in the mediastinum is the thymus now this uh, different signs are given uh, names based on what it mimics and those who are exam going must have an idea about what these signs are well what would you do if you don't see a thymic shadow in the newborn x ray obviously you would be worried and more so this may be an indirect marker to suggest that it could be an underlying congenital heart defect or it could be thymic hyperplasia but the commonest cause in the neonatal period of an absent thymic shadow is severe sepsis however if you are in doubt you would take an x ray lateral view to identify this structure 
or you may do an ultrasound to identify the thymus. The key point that needs to be kept in mind is the thymus never causes mass effect. And that is how we would interpret a thymus in a given X-ray chest. So our interpretation of airway involves uh, looking at the airway in particular, followed by hilum and the mediastinum. Now, following uh, airway, hilum and mediastinum, let's look at the lungs. And what we mean here is looking at the lung volume. By that we mean, how is the aeration of the lungs? Well, there is only one condition which comes with low lung volume in newborns, and that is classically a preterm with respiratory distress syndrome. In other conditions affecting the lungs, the lung volume is either normal or maybe increased. Well, what we must identify is, is it a unilateral or a bilateral lung disease? Is it a focal or a diffuse lung disease? Is it a symmetrical or asymmetrical lung disease? And whether it's a radiolucent or a radio-opaque shadow. If you're able to describe the X-ray with these adjectives, the impression appears that you know how to interpret an X-ray and the diagnosis almost becomes self-obvious. Well, we also must look at the lung zones and the lung for that matter is divided into upper zone, mid zone and the lower zone. And you would compare the upper zone with the middle zone and further with the lower zone and then compare the right side with the left side. Mind you, you should not confuse the lobes with the zones. Here, we are talking about zones and not lobes of the lung. And therefore, if we are able to describe the lungs, taking the use of these adjectives in this manner over the lung zones, the diagnosis becomes self-obvious. Now, there are two shadows that you will always see on an X-ray chest. One is the white shadow. And whenever you see a white shadow, you must think of no air. That means that lung is collapsed. The classical findings are uniform density, deviation of the trachea towards the same affected site. The other condition which gives rise to a uniform uh, white shadow or opacification is free fluid. And that is as classically seen with pleural effusion. Again, there is uniform density of the affected side, but more importantly, the trachea is deviated away from the affected side. And lastly, a consolidation also gives rise to pacification, but is localized to a particular zone. And that is how you appreciate uh, a white shadow on an X-ray. In contrast, look at the black shadow. You find that there is a more uh, black on this side of the lung, that means there is more free air and it is air collecting beyond the lungs. There is loss of lung volume telling you that this is a pneumothorax. In contrast, again, you find that there is a black shadow, that means air which has been accumulated. This is uh, not affecting the underlying vascular lung markings and therefore, this is a space occupying lesion, which is cystic in nature, which has got accumulated air, which appears black. And this is a space occupying lesion on the left hemithorax causing shift of the mediastinum. Having looked at the lung fields, let, let's look at the bones. When we talk about bones, we must appreciate that uh, we are talking and looking at the clavicles, the vertebrae, the ribs and the humerus. And this will help us to have a structured approach. Now look at this X-ray. It shows white shadow going beyond the lungs, which is secondary to increased soft tissue edema. Now look at this X-ray. It shows black shadows going into the neck, suggesting of air, which is leaking from the lungs up. This is a subcutaneous emphysema. Now look at this X-ray. It shows a calcification of the clavicle telling us that there was an old fracture of the left clavicle. So what it means is the soft tissues and the bones are often overlooked and need a structured approach. Now look at this X-ray. What it shows is a hemivertebrae. And henceforward, anytime you find any congenital lung anomaly, 20 to 40% of them would be associated with an underlying vertebral 
anorectal, cardiac, tracheoesophageal, renal, or limb anomaly. And henceforward, you will do a vectoral search for all newborns with an underlying congenital lung anomaly. The C of the ABCDEF stands for cardiac. We are looking at the size, shape, position, and the heart border. Now, the maximum right and the maximum left border of the heart is compared with the maximum transthoracic diameter and a CT ratio, cardiothoracic ratio, is calculated by the formula B plus C upon A. Now, if you have the CT ratio more than 0.6 on an AP view, some would say more than 0.5, you would define this as cardiomegaly. Now, look at this. Uh, shape of the heart, it is a boot shaped heart telling you that it is possibly an underlying tetralogy of fellows. Look at the abnormal position of the heart. This is telling you that there is a dextrocardia and look at uh, the right and the left border of the heart. The right border of the heart is made predominantly by the right atrium and the left border of the heart is made predominantly by the left ventricle and therefore a uh, right, increase in the right or the left border reflects a pathology affecting the particular or uh, cavities of the heart. Having looked at the airway, looked at the uh, bones, soft tissues, the cardiac, let's look and focus on the diaphragm. Normally, both the domes of the diaphragms are easily visible and clear. The right diaphragm is slightly up compared to the left. At times, the uh, dome of the diaphragm may be missing and you would see multiple cystic lesions with air-filled columns extending into the thoracic cavity, suggesting that there is a congenital diaphragmatic hernia. Versus at times you would find that one of the domes of the diaphragm at a higher level compared to the opposite side. And this would suggest that either it is secondary to trauma, underlying neurogenic problem, or a congenital problem affecting the diaphragm or something below which, which is pushing the diaphragm up. So asymmetric domes is pathological. At times, and what is commonly missed is there may be free accumulation of air below the diaphragm telling you that this is a air leak which has taken place. At times, you would find that the costophrenic angle is lost and this is an earliest marker of free fluid in the lungs. You would also look at the cardiophrenic angle, which uh, would suggest uh, presence of pericardial effusion. Normally, the costophrenic and the cardiophrenic angle on both the right and the left side are easily and clearly visible. Now look at this domes of the diaphragm. It is flat on both the sides, giving you a clear diagnosis that this is an hyperinflated chest because of overventilation. And therefore, uh, looking and having an idea about the position of the diaphragms gives you crucial information, both in terms of aeration, in terms of a subtle lung pathology. Having said that, the E stands for all the extra things that you need to look at. And these are extra things that the baby was not born with. And the commonest here for a baby on the ventilator is the endotracheal tube, which is one centimeter above the carina and usually at T1 or T2 vertebrae. Now look at this X-ray. What you find here is an endotracheal tube, but a air column which is away from the endotracheal tube, telling us clearly that you have intubated the esophagus and not the endotracheal tube. Now look at this X-ray. The endotracheal tube is way down into the right bronchus and there is collapse of the left lung telling us that you have intubated the right main bronchus. The other thing of interest is to look at the catheters or the umbilical lines and you have this line which dips down and then moves up. This is an umbilical artery catheter which classically follows the course of the umbilical artery. So the umbilical artery dips into the pelvis and then runs up. If it is a low umbilical artery position, it is placed at L3, L4. If it is a high umbilical artery position, it is placed at T6, T9. Now look at this 
uh, line which is there and you find that this line is running parallel to the vertebrae, vertebral column and it is on the right side and it is just one centimeter above the dome of the diaphragm. This is the umbilical venous catheter which is in the correct position. Now look at this x-ray. What you find here is a feeding tube which is going right into the stomach, okay. What you also find is the endotracheal tube which has got stuck and what you have here is a endotracheal tube which, which should have been uh, at T1, T2 which is much higher up than the carina and this leads to a iatrogenic higher pressures being required to ventilate the lung and the commonest error that you would find in an x-ray chest of a baby on the ventilator is abnormal position of the endotracheal tube. Lastly, the F of our structured approach looks at the fundic bubble. Normally, the fundic bubble should be seen on the right side. What you see here is coiling of the feeding tube telling you obviously that this is a tracheoesophageal fistula, but there is gas in the abdomen, so there is a fistula. Again, the feeding tube is getting coiled, but there is no gas in the abdomen. So this is an esophageal atresia. And now what you find here is the red rubber catheter got stuck up in the trachea and therefore obviously a diagnosis of tracheoesophageal fistula was made. You thought that you have uh, made a great diagnosis. What also was staring where the double bubble appearance suggests you of duodenal atresia telling us that if you find one major anomaly, you must search for associated anomaly. And I then again retreat that you find any one major anomaly, especially if there is a congenital lung anomaly that you have identified 20 to 40% of the time, you must look for associated vectoral anomalies. And lastly, what you find here is there is abnormal position of the heart. So there is dextrocardia, but there is abnormal position also of the fundic bubble, which should have been on the left side is now seen on the right and the liver is on the right. So there is a dextrocardia with situs inverses. And isolated dextrocardia has a higher incidence of associated cardiac malformations versus uh, dextrocardia with situs inverses would practically not be associated with underlying congenital anomaly. And therefore, fundic bubble gives you a good idea about uh, the underlying approach. So what have we learned? We have learned a structured and organized approach to interpretation of X-ray chest. What we learned was the doctor ABCDE approach. So your interpretation would start with saying that this is the X-ray chest AP view of baby of Lata, day six of life, uh, admitted for respiratory distress. It is well centralized, well exposed. The X-ray is adi shows adequate inspiration. The X-ray shows that the airway column is in the center. The hilar markings are equal on both the sides. There is no abnormal mediastinal pathology. The lungs are symmetrical on both the sides. There are no abnormal markings, opacifications, or radiolucent shadows which are visible. The cardiac size, shape, and position is normal. Both the domes of diaphragm are normal and the costophrenic and the cardiophrenic angles are clear. There is an endotracheal tube in position. It is quite high in the airway column above the carina and it needs to be replaced. There are uh, no abnormalities in the soft tissues or of the bones. The fundic bubble is visible on the left side. So that gives you a clear impression of giving a structured and organized a uh, way of interpreting an X-ray chest, what is called as a doctor ABCDEF approach. So thank you very much for joining for the first half of interpretation of X-ray chest. In the second half, we shall learn about uh, classical X-ray patterns, diagnostic of medical or surgical disorders and their variations and complications. So do tune in for the second part of interpretation of X-ray chest. Thank you very much.